<laughs> okay, uh, if we can. Uh, I understand we had some audio problems, uh, which is uh, nothing to get upset about. Uh, so you saw some t talking heads, but you couldn't hear Let's the talking heads. So, so I'm I'm the oldest talking head here, Bill Gustin, Miami-Dade Fire Rescue uh, Training Division. And uh, my compadre is uh, Juan Miguel. Gives me another excuse to put my arm around you again. Yes. Yes, right. <laughs> so Juan Miguel is a captain in our training division that is doing great things with search and rescue. Uh, as I said before, silently, unless you can read my lips, is that uh, our number one tactical priority in a structure fire is the protection of civilian life. Tactically, we have three options of how to fulfill that. One is remove the occupants from harm. Take them down a ladder, drag them through the smoke, take them out the door, vent enter search, isolate search, take them out a window. Remove the harm from the occupant. That's what we do in fireproof multiple dwellings. Most uh, occupants are safer in their units. So we put the fire out, take the harm away from them. But what we're gonna put our emphasis on today is isolation, where we isolate the occupants from the harm, typically using the integrity of a closed door. So, uh, and talk about timing. I just submitted an article. My motivation was the work that uh, Juan and Chief George May have been doing with search and rescue, uh, where we've considered one of these days we're gonna run into a 400 pound person and we're not gonna be dragging them 30, 40 feet down a smoky or hallway that's on fire. And I don't know that we wanna take somebody out of a, uh, a fairly smoke-free bedroom or apartment and take them out into a hostile environment. So we're looking at isolation and uh, Juan and George have uh, been working a lot on that. Juan, you wanna tell a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Captain. No, uh, I've been working in the training division now for uh, about six months with the with the good captain here, and it's been a great opportunity. I'm, you know, it's just amazing working with him. Uh, prior to that, I did a little bit of recruit training, um, and I've been with the county now for 17 years, and I did some time in another department before that. But this opportunity that I have now, working side by side with the good captain has been amazing. Um, I'm definitely gonna take advantage of that. Uh, and then with Chief George May, which is another amazing individual, a guy who I look up to so much uh, that I work with side by side on the field and uh, plenty of fires and uh, has been, you know, just uh, great in, in, uh, in influencing my career, both of these individuals. I get to work side by side with him now during this, uh, project that we're putting together uh so i'm just blessed to be here and i want to thank you for you know inviting us here um uh, george may and i are actually putting together a uh, an operations manual and uh, george will be more elegant in telling you you know the details on that uh and it's starting with a search and rescue manual so this was a perfect platform to you know kind of learn and uh do our thing here with you guys so thank you for that Go ahead, Chief George. Tell a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is George May. I'm the Battalion 3 uh, Miami-Dade. Um, I've been with the department for 20, going on 22 years now. Um, and I've been out in the field my whole career. Um, I haven't had a, I never had the opportunity to go to training. I would have liked to have gone for a little while, but uh, those days I think are behind me. Um, Battalion 3 is a pretty busy battalion, and uh, I've had this idea for the last couple of years to start writing some training manuals for our department, um, similar to the ones I've seen with LA County or FDNY, um, ones that I felt like they are large departments, and in order to get uniformity, uh, on such a large department, I felt like the manuals would help us and we didn't have any. Um, at the time I had the ideas, the political environment, the upstairs chiefs, I didn't think would be receptive to the idea. Uh, we've had a changing of the guard. And um, when I did,
pitched the idea to them. They jumped all over it and um, allowed Juan and I sort of carte blanche to start off on this uh, search and rescue manual. Uh, so that's sort of where we're at. We've been, I don't know, what are you, about two months into it now, Juan? Um, and we're just getting our wheels turning with it. Uh, it's, you know, maybe it's opened up as many questions as it's, as it's answered uh, questions. So we're, that's sort of where we're at. Well, good. Thank you so much for participating today. And uh, it looks like we've got the good Captain Clark Lamping. So, hey, by the way, Clark, you're not the only one with a master's degree because uh, our Chief George May has a master's degree. And one thing that I will never forget, uh, a true George Mayism, that once you make captain on a major metropolitan fire department and consider some of the other disciplines such as EMS, technical rescue, and hazmat, you've earned your master's degree. Again, I was going to ask you, what was tougher, uh, Chief, uh, achieving captain and then chief or getting your, um, your master's degree? Uh, the process to get to captain, I would say, would, was harder than getting the master's degree. Well, and I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it can't be that hard because look at Clark Lamping. <laughs> Clark Lamping has a master's degree. Not I mean, all departments is... are created the same, Bill. Oh, okay. <laughs> Clark <laughs> I say that as I as we've as we've copied uh, Clark County's uh, incident command worksheet, almost almost without without any shame at all. Yeah, so, and shameless. And, yeah, the people that put that together uh, let people share all the time. There's no there's no uh, there's no territorial anything like that. They they love to share that. But as far as the master's degree, uh, Chief May might have a master's degree like me, but I am definitely more handsome. In fact, I think I'm the most handsome in the whole group today. Uh, okay, just throwing that okay. out there. Right. Um, uh, yeah, Clark Lamping. I'm a captain with the Clark County Fire Department in uh, Southern Nevada, Las Vegas area. I've been on the job for 22 years. I've been a captain for about 11 years. I recently moved stations. I am now a captain of Engine 38 um, in a uh, kind of suburbs, more rural community. I was on Las Vegas Boulevard for a long time, about 17 years in our high-rise district, Las Vegas Boulevard, and I just decided I needed I needed a change, so I... Uh, jumped and now I am Captain of Engine 38. Okay, uh, Captain Mike Dugan, sir. Yes, sir, Mike Dugan. I'm a retired captain from the New York City Fire Department and I'm looking forward to a great discussion today. Okay, do we have Sam with us? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay, Sam? Actually, I think you are the smartest guy in this group. Uh, you may not have a you're a deep you're a deep thinker, Sam, and that's why we asked you to be on. You're going to be our subject matter expert on um, on uh, the thermal imaging cameras. Um, we talk about timing, fellas. Is uh, my motivation for writing this article about um, isolation? I've already submitted it was Chief May and Juan, because we never consider, although almost every day somewhere on our department, Miami-Dade, we've got the equivalent of a house fire assignment being dispatched to get a 400 plus pound person out of a small bedroom and out onto a, uh, a patient carrier and into a, uh, a medic unit where we have to take the, the stretcher out. And uh, we do it all the time, but we never consider, what are we going to do when we encounter these people in a fire? Well, we're not taking them out. We're going to hope that the, the bedroom door remains intact, and historically, it does. And uh, in terms of research, it does, even though it's filled with cardboard. Um, we call it hollow core, but it's not really hollow core. And... Um, or we find somebody like that. Let's say we find a big person in a, in a hallway. Or rather than dragging them 30 feet through IDLH uh, conditions, maybe drag them into a bedroom and shut the door. Now, um, Tammy, are we going to be able to show that video? 
Okay, when she comes back on, we actually have a, a video of, of, of us doing that. Here, I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, Captain, I'm going to put it up right now. Okay, okay. Yeah, guys. Uh, we'll give it a shot. Okay, here we go. Hey, I got a victim. I got a victim. Okay, now talk about timing, and our hats go off to the personnel of FDNY Ladder 34 and Engine 84 for a fire they had on the 30th floor <laughs> of a high-rise building. Are we still there? Yeah. Uh, on Saturday, um, I really encourage you to go to fireengineering.com and, and look at the second video. And right at the beginning of the video, you'll hear firefighter Geraldo Irena. 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 Yeah, all right. From Ladder 34, transmitting that he's got two victims, 1045s, in a back bedroom, and the fire has flared up again. They were trying to control it with a can while engine 84 was, uh, was stretching, uh, presumably. So he says, the fire's flared up again. I can't get out of the bedroom. I'm controlling the bedroom door, and he did. And I'll just read you this excerpt. Lieutenant George Diaz and firefighter, yeah, ladder 34 began to knock down some of the fire with a can when they heard people screaming. They began to make their way towards the back of the fire apartment. Lieutenant Diaz found more individuals and was able to remove them from the building. Firefighter <laughs> found two more people in the back room but due to increasing fire in the apartment, decided to isolate himself with the individuals in the back room until the fire was out. Our members inside were able to knock down the fire and clear a visible path for firefighter Urena, and the two people were trapped to safely exit through the interior of the building, says FDNY Lieutenant Thomas Donahue of Engine 34, who along with members of Ladder 34 was on the scene of this all hands uh, Manhattan fire on Saturday. Hat to those guys. Talk about timing. Rather than take and put himself at risk and put the occupants at risk, he isolated, which is one of our three tactical ways of protecting uh civilian life, which is our first um, strategic uh, priority. So it was just great. You had made the video before. I did. So, yeah, I mean, when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, a light bulb went off in my head. A very dim bulb, Yeah. very dim bulb, but a bulb nonetheless. Um, Captain Mike, you I know you've made more grabs than anybody on this job. Uh, have you ever been in a situation like this that either out of necessity or choice or maybe a little bit of both, you elected to keep the person uh, where they're at or pulled them into a, 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 an area of refuge and closed the door? Definitely, Bill. We have definitely brought people into areas of refuge to protect them from the fire, protect them from the heat. And very honestly, if you're wearing a mask and they're not, taking them out through the fire, you're exposing them to the high heat. They could get thermal burns of their lungs or whatever else. It's a brilliant move. Um, I also say going through that uh, door in that back bedroom, you know, closing the door. And one of the moves that I have seen done a couple of times, and it's to, to keep the fire at bay, 
is grab another door or a mattress, grab a closet door and put it up over that door. If it starts, if the door starts to fail, putting another door there or a mattress there just to stop it from getting into the room, to stop the products of combustion from getting in where you are. That are good ways to protect you and the people in there. That fire you're talking about with um, engine, 80, engine 84 and lighter 34, I think it was on the 17th floor. So you're not gonna get people to a window and ask for ladders. That's not gonna happen. So depending on your buildings, where you are, in the video that you showed, you know, if you're going, to, if it's on the second floor, you can call for a ladder. If you're on the, the above the 10th or 12th floor, depending on your uh, ladders and everything else, if you're in a high rise building, there is no ladder coming for you. Okay, so you have to have that. That's a tool that every one of us should have in our toolbox. That's something that we need to think about. The other thing you might want to think about is having somebody now down in the street bring up an extra Scott pack. Once we get the fire knocked down, we're not going to be taking a feed when we're overhauling. Hopefully, we've gotten smarter than that. And we're going to bring up a pack and put it on these people real quickly just to walk them out into the hallway to get them through the smoke and everything else. Captain Again, Mike, I saw you guys do that. He went to the fast truck compartment where you keep your rapid intervention pack. And uh, they, it was not an emergency. The lady was fine. Went in and put the mask from the rapid intervention crew uh, pack on uh, an elderly lady in a wheelchair and wheeled her out like the gentlemen that those firefighters are. Yes, great point. Um, I encourage you to look at fire engineering's training minutes uh, from a few years ago. They're archived, uh, produced by uh, Chief Jim Walsh and uh, I'm not sure his rank, uh, Eric Wheaton from the uh, Winter Park Fire Department. Uh, they examined the construction of uh, common household doors. Uh, and as much as we say they're hollow core, they're not hollow. And it will explain that there's, they're not hollow and what is actually in them. What's in them is cardboard and it's remarkable. And they will also uh, demonstrate uh, removing the door, how to remove the door as you were just uh, alluding to. Um, another thing I want to encourage, uh, we all have a, a, a great mutual friend in uh, Mike Galliano. Mike has a training program called the Art of Go and No Go. And Mike's message is to the, I can't, I can't remember exactly the words, but don't be so quick to write off occupants. How many times we've been to a, a, a dwelling fire and it looks like it is fully involved. And then afterwards, we get inside, there's heavy, heavy fire damage, heavy fire damage. Can you see the pictures? And you open the door and the room is pristine. So you can have a total burnout of the entire structure, but one, you could have occupants that took refuge behind a closed door in a bedroom or a, um, uh, a bathroom or a closet. So um, I wanna talk about vent enter search. I'm gonna let Clark begin the discussion uh, because he, have, you have some pretty strong opinions on uh, the basic fundamentals of what goes into a uh, VEIS uh, operation, Clark. We discussed it over the phone the other day. Would you would you kind of repeat what you told me the other day? Uh, yes, <clears throat> I spent one year in our training division, and uh, one of the things we tried to accomplish was VEIS training, and I was uh, surprised very I was surprised at the lack of ability of firefighters, engine and truck company firefighters to throw ladders. And I believe this is one reason, this is probably the primary reason why VEIS is not the primary uh, search. People still choose to go interior and search for victims like that. Um, I, I, I saw so many just odd things with individuals, firefighters, taking ladders off the engine and throwing them up to the side of a building and click, 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 six clicks 
to throw it into a second story window. And it was absolutely unacceptable in my opinion that anyone who owns a ladder does not know how many clicks it takes to get to a second story window. It is one on a 24 foot duo safety extension ladder. It is one click to put the tip of that ladder in the window seal. It is two clicks to put the tip of the ladder in the window seal and have the rescue angle. And I believe before we start training VEIS, we have to go back to fundamental ladder training. Um, that's, it's, it's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. And it's, it is the number one failure of the VEIS is the, the ability to use ladders efficiently. Clark, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Juan to talk about how we, uh, for instance, in terms of roof ventilation, we don't show people how to operate a chain or a rotary saw before they know how to operate an ax. So would you speak on your, uh, how, how your, your training regimen uh, takes place and progresses with and without the tick? As far as the search and rescue? Yes. And, well, we've, uh, we've come up to kind of a sense as a document that's gonna try to standardize the whole department. We've, uh, uh, George, May, and I have developed a, a set of rules um, that kind of correlate to all our searches uh, from the non-tick to the tick, but we want to make it something simple, something very easy to uh, teach and learn, and uh, something that we can modify with different situations. I mean, the search and rescues, the, the variety of situations just is endless. So it's diff difficult to put something on a document that, that, uh, that I guess you could say uh, standardizes everything. Uh, so what we've done is we created a, a basic, our basic traditional type left and right type search. Uh, we changed it up just slightly for, for um, I guess you could say for more thorough and rapid searches. And then we've progressively gone into what we would probably do uh, more commonly would be a tick directed search. But it kind of, it kind of uh, plays out um, where if something would go, go wrong, we could easily revert back to the traditional uh, more uh, left without and right a, without, a tick. without a tick. So we're playing both at the same time. That way we could uh, teach our crews uh, in, in all different type of situations, um, mostly because of the size of our department. Our department is huge and the, the variety of uh, skilled individuals and, and physically able individuals it's uh it makes it, it very so uh we wanted to play every little component and make sure that uh we can modify the search appropriately uh but we've gone from a a basic search is really more of a team search in the larger rooms to an oriented search in the bedrooms and then the tick search uh basically the same way and i'm, I'm sure george uh, could explain the way we're doing our tick search in the larger rooms and also and oriented search in the bedroom. So it's very simple. It's almost like a little matrix that the individuals could actually follow through just by saying, what can I see? How good is my visibility? How good is the picture on my tick? And then modify into uh, these little avenues. Uh, I'm and not sure if I made it clear, but that's kind of what we have. done an absolutely remarkable job of replicating a great room. A great room, typically with a high ceiling, is a combination, as you know, of a living room, dining room, uh, family room, and uh, it opens up to a kitchen. You built an L-shaped counter, and you know that you cannot f just stay on a wall and search the interior of a great room. So, uh, you know, we, we spend so much time searching bedrooms where you could follow the wall and, or you, you just reach in because you're not, and spread your arms out. But the great room, well, you that know, takes more, takes more practice. In, in Dade County, you know how it is here. All new buildings come up all the time and there's new concept of open, you know, open concept type rooms. So, uh, where we worked, uh, these rooms were fairly small, but uh, in Kendall, 
or down south, these are large, large rooms, you know, over a thousand square foot open concept type rooms. And for since I've been in recruit training, you know, years before I came over here as a captain, we wanted to build that room. It was just something um, that now with this whole thing with uh, George May and I, uh, with the operations manual, it was an absolute that we needed it. So we, we jumped on it. Uh, with the help of the training division and George May, and we uh, we've accomplished a, a lot in a in a in a very little time, and and uh, I think it's looking pretty good. The great room is good. The guys love it. George May, could you explain to our viewers um, the the techniques that uh, through trial and error and repetition and repetition and repetition and repetition? God bless you guys. And you picked a nice cool time of the year to do it. Okay, but what have you found through trial and error works the best for searching the great room, the open floor plan concept? I think you're muted, Chief. Chief, you're muted. Our you bread go. and butter, um, our bread and butter on NDFR is going to be the tick directive. Uh, I think that's generally going to be most departments at this point. If you spend any time with the tick and it's working and if you've trained with it, you're going to get uh, a faster, more efficient search if you've practiced it. Um, you know, like Juan said, we always want to be able to fall back to an oriented search or a wall directed search if the tick fails. Um, but what we've been working on the last few weeks is dividing the open space, cutting it into quadrants. So if you think about your layout uh, in Dade County, most of our search crews are gonna be a crew of three. Um, so imagine the officer is gonna anchor that search crew. He's gonna show them what he sees on the tick really quickly, give them a visual layout, and he'll send them, uh, let's say off to the left where the living area is. He'll, he'll tell them, you know, crawl to that uh, sofa, search that area. Once he sends them off, he's watching them on the tick. He's sort of corralling them. That's the word we use a lot. And, uh, you know, he'll, he'll split that open space into quadrants. So as he'll move into the open area, get different angles of, that, of the living room. Let's say we're, we're in the living room as they search the spots that he can't see with the tick. Now, if it's an open area in the middle that's not blocked by furniture or anything like that, he can slide right through that area. We don't need to waste a lot of time. The tick is able to see it. And he'll meet them at an opposing corner. But the key is, and it's one of our seven rules, we're always in voice contact. So Juan plays a nice soundtrack of uh, heavy metal, 80s rock in the background, makes it really hard for them to communicate and we're finding about 10 feet is about max distance for crews to spread out before we lose voice communication. If and when it works, uh, we're cutting the times, the search times by a lot. Um, the crews are more efficient. They're able to divide the space. The officer needs to be very alpha. He needs to collect his crew. He needs to keep talking. He can't be soft-spoken, he or she can't be soft-spoken. And they need to know as they're moving, they're getting voice affirmation. Good, you got all the couches, move to the wall to your right. Move to the window, I'm waiting for you at the window. And they're able to cut through that space extremely quickly. Uh, and that's what we've been working on so far. And that's sort of been working the best in cutting these open area concept, living room, living dining room, family room, you know, kitchen areas. We've been able to cut the space really quickly. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to those videos. And uh, of course we will share them with uh, uh, fire engineering as we, as we do a lot of our things. And we do that for two reasons. You know, it's no secret. I'm technical editor for fire engineering, one of them, uh, but also, uh, it's been the tradition of our previous fire chief and the, the, the current chief and our chief in charge of the training division. He wants our department, Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Fire Department, to look good in the eyes of the nation's fire service. And we do that by sharing everything that we have. So I share it on the, on the webpage. Uh, Sam, 
Sam, you've put a lot of thought and you've had some really neat ideas about training with the limitations with the, uh, the tick. Uh, I know you did something with the oven and aluminum foil, uh, something like that. But um, you have some unique ways of explaining the capabilities and limitations of the tick. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, like one of the things when we, uh, it kind of goes back to learning to do ladders before you best or learning to uh, understand your saws before you get on a roof and uh, start to put holes in it. Um, so one of the things that we do in our truck academy is we go through a thermal imaging program and we'll talk about the science of it. Um, we'll get into um, uh, like Bernoulli's laws and um, Kirchhoff's laws. And that way, once we uh, agree that we can't argue the, um, the natural environment around us, uh, then we actually start to do some experiments with the thermal imager to um, show them how the thermal imager will lie to us. Uh, I know I made the mistake early on that I felt like the thermal imager was a handheld fire coach, and it's not. Um, if we don't understand the focal way that uh, emissivity reacts in an fire environment, then we can actually get in trouble. Uh, I'll tell you what, just listening to the chief, I heard some really, really good things that you don't hear very much. Um, one of them is uh, getting out there in that uh, open footprint um, after you let your guys see what they're going to actually go search, uh, because that perspective is going to be huge. Uh, we, we think that we have peripheral vision with the thermal imager, but we're really limited with our focal plane. Um, it's kind of like taking a flashlight. If I take a flashlight and I bring it up close to the wall, then I get a really nice uh, tight, tight circle, right? And when I bring that flashlight back away from the wall, then it kind of opens up and expands. And that's the way the thermal imager is. So when we try to search with it, that's like uh, trying to use a flashlight against the wall three foot away. Um, we're missing everything to the left. We're missing everything to the right. We can actually, believe it or not, just at a five foot level, if we look out the focal plane, the way it diminishes, we will miss everything at our feet or up to 12 feet, we won't see anything below us. At three feet, it'll be nine feet. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. It's, a, it's kind of a technical thing, but again, getting out there in the open and getting that perspective is what's gonna allow you to see um, vanishing points. It's gonna allow you to see um, areas that you can't clear with the tick. You know, one of the nice things about the people that are doing these open floor concepts is they're kind of subscribing to the minimalism, right? So they want this open floor concept and then they don't go in and pack it full of furniture. So we can use that to our advantage. We can clear a lot of that footprint really early by being very methodical in how we use the thermal imager and be very deliberate. You go here, you go here, I can't see what's happening back there. Come back here and then we're gonna go over there. Sam, uh, I'm gonna have to uh, give a shout out to Key. Uh, we started late, so I, I'm going to take the liberty of saying we're going to end late, okay? I don't think anybody here is in a big hurry, uh, So, because we've got a lot to cover. And I can already tell that we're going we're gonna to do this again next month with a different, with a different panel, uh, except for Captain Mike and myself. Uh, we're always going to be the constants, constants in the room. Um, key hose, again, easy endorsement for me. Uh, Mighty, I was in charge of getting us kicking and screaming uh, to accept the fact that inch and three quarter hose was a roll of the dice and a leap of faith. Sooner or later, we were going to get our asses burnt. And uh, the problem is for us in in South Florida, actually the entire state is the non-sprinklered condominiums. Everything else has been retrofitted with at least partial sprinklered, but not the condominiums because again, each unit is privately owned. So uh, I'm not saying that the two inch combat ready, is, I'm not recommending that to anybody. I'm not recommending any size hose to anybody. What I'm recommending is you better do your homework, you better look at your fire loads, you better look at your fire areas, your potential volume of fire, look at the uh, maintenance uh, in the age and the condition of your fire suppression systems, your fire pumps, your standpipes, and find out 
that uh, what you need. So there's not one size fits all. But one thing is a constant. You cannot do better than Kehoe's. Any of their any of their grades, and there's several different grades. I'm a combat ready guy, but I know departments that are using the True ID, and uh, they rave about the uh, the kink resistance as well. It's pretty hard. I'm, I, I say this on every hangout. Take the key challenge. Try to kink key combat ready. You can't do it. Um, Mike, Captain Mike, uh, could you tell us about an incident that occurred in New York City involving some police officers that um, took occupants out of their tenable apartment and with a very poor outcome? Sorry, Bill. Sorry, Bill. I just got a phone call. Sorry. Do you, um, you need to go, Mike? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. Um, what happened with the police officers was uh, New York City police officers went into a building and not knowing the fire department, two, there were two cases uh, that had very bad outcomes. One was the police officers, went, two police officers went into a building uh, for a report of smoke and they went up to the eighth floor in the elevator. And the fire was a twin mattress in the eighth floor hallway set by a bored 16 year old kid. And Officer Dennis Guerra uh, survived for three days. But they was, um, he was brain dead. He was uh, starved of oxygen and died afterwards. And his partner, Rosa, I think it was Rosa Rodriguez, uh, will be on oxygen for the rest of her life because of one twin mattress, the smoke. The other one with the police officers where they went into a building and the fire department told people to stay where they were. And the police said, no, 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 we got to get you out of here. And it was a, a grandmother who was bedridden, but she was um, a larger woman, you know, not... 400 pounds by any, but she was a 140 pound woman, 150 pound woman, started carrying it down in the smoke and he couldn't do it. He put her down and she couldn't move and she died in the hallway. And the New York City Police Department, um, it's going to, I don't know if they've settled yet, but it's going to cost them millions of dollars. I mean, that woman died. The apartment was as clear as where I am right now. So just the idea of, you are safer away from that smoke than you are in that smoke. We teach that to everyone. Civilians, you know, close before you doze. Close the door. A door buys you time. Call the fire department. We teach it to the civilians in the city of New York. Okay, close the door. Buy yourself some time. Put more doors between you and other people. And it's amazing how well it works. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Get fire... The you recognize that picture, sir? Yeah, I took that picture. That was from a fatal fire in Brooklyn. That was the apartment that was on fire. Yep. All right, so the occupant of that uh, succumbed. Yes. Damn it. You know, okay, I got it. I keep getting these calls. I, I have legions of adoring females that are constantly calling me. Okay, yep. so, because um, if there was never, this is like, such a testimonial to the effectiveness that is that's the adjoining apartment door correct and if you look closely if you hold that a little higher bill you can little keep going you can see right there on the the peephole in the door where the peephole swelled from the heat because you can see the original brown color of the door and how it swelled up from the heat okay go to the next one bill you're not going to believe this I mean, that's the apartment of that woman who slept through the fire on the 14th floor of a high rise, multiple dwelling, steel door, she slept through the fire. There was almost no smoke mitigation around the door. Very, very little. Her apartment was clear as a bell. Slept through it. Next morning, she's like, what's going on here? You know, it's a, um... I think we all agree of that. And, and like I say, uh, my department shoots ourselves in the foot because we allow these pre-recorded messages. There is a fire in the building. Evacuate the building on all floors. Well, that's real comforting if I'm in a, uh, in a walker. We do There's not allow recorded messages for that reason, Bill. Correct. Now, kind of 
kind of showed the police in a bad light. I hear I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna show the police in a good light for a change. Fire blowing out of the front of this house when we arrived. The cops, they did their 360 and they hear a window shaker, window air conditioner running. They pulled it out of the window, stepped up on it, reached in and snatched the invalid occupant that was in a bed directly below the air conditioner. So God bless the cops. They, uh, they did that there. Now, I'm going to ask Captain Lamping if this is something he sees in, uh, in his area. We talk about isolating with a door. And uh, I had a guy, Ricky Cruz, and Ricky says, hey, Cap, I was teaching the class, you can't isolate uh, my bedrooms with the door because, uh, the, uh, because of the air returns. I said, no, oh, come on. The air return is the space between the bottom of the door and the floor. Not in my house. Now the guy raises his hand. Not in my house either. Not in my house. So can you see what I'm, look, there's a trunk of ductwork, Clark. And then in the bedrooms, you can see there's two registers. One, you can shut off. That's the supply. The other is the return. So there is not complete isolation of the, uh, of the bedrooms with these high efficiency air conditioner systems. Do you see that in your area? Yes, absolutely. That is... That might be a picture of a track home. That is standard track home construction and HVAC systems in Las Vegas. And we do have a lot of them. Obviously, we're extremely hot and dry in Las Vegas, so we have a lot of AC work. We have a lot of air returns throughout all types of construction in Las Vegas. And Chief May, you were talking about voice contact. Um, your average size home, that's 1,200 square feet, 1,500 square feet. If it's a conventional floor plan, the bedrooms will all be grouped together, either at the one side of the house, in the rear, or at the top of the stairs. So if you consider, how did these occupants get trapped in the first place? They got trapped because there's only one way in and one way out, and their way out, their only way out, is blocked by smoke and product of combustion. So it stands to reason you're not searching a bowling alley here. It stands to reason you can search those bedrooms and still remain in voice contact. And if you keep some type of consistent pattern, you will come back to the officer. You have to. There's only one way out. So DES is very effective in certain situations. Uh, should it be on our, our, uh, our, in our playbook? Yes. But uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask Captain Mike, arguably, arguably, VES originated with, uh, with Ladders 4. I could be totally wrong on that. But that's an operations manual like what Chief May is trying to put together now. Uh, but when you guys roll up, you've got six guys on a, six firefighters, firefighters on a ladder company. So I don't think you're going to be in a situation where you're standing in the front yard thinking, well, what, what should we do? Should we VES those windows or should we start an interior search? Would I be correct in saying that you, because of your staffing, you can kind of do both? We, Bill, I got to say the FDNY is one of the most um, driven by our, our SOGs, our standard operating guidelines. Lattice 3 was the start of VES. That was tenement operations. And we have our positions assigned. The OV, the outside vent, the roof person, the irons, the can, the officer, and the chauffeur. Depending on the type of building you respond to and get there. Is it a row frame? Is it a three-window row frame or is it a four-window row frame? Four window row frames, three window row frames are one apartment per floor. Four window row frames are usually two windows per floor. So you're going to go different things. Okay. A brownstone. Brownstone is, was built as a private dwelling. Is it a fireproof multiple dwelling? It is a non-fireproof multiple dwelling. Each position has an assignment 
based on the building they pull up to. And every fireman in the city of New York knows when they pull up to a building, they look at the building and they determine what type of building that is and what we are going there. Okay, is it a private dwelling? Lot is four, private dwellings, PDs, engine operations, what, where they're gonna stretch. Is it a large building? If it's like an H type or an E type where we have different wings, you never stretch the line up for the odor of smoke. The truck has to go up there and find a fire because it's happened to me where we've gone up the front staircase because the guy's complaining of smoke. We have to come back down, go up the back staircase because the fire's on the top floor in the rear but his apartment backs up to it. So he's getting the smoke on the front side. You got to run back down. If the engine stretches up there, they're out of lock. Okay. So the engine has to be disciplined enough to stay in the lobby with their hose and enough hose to cover the entire building. Okay. You have to know the type of building you are pulling up to and you have to have sized it up. And those are the important things depending on, and it also depends on the type of apparatus you're in. If you're in a rear mount, or you're in a towel ladder where the chauffeur has to stay on the turntable in a towel ladder and the OVM is now in the uh, bucket. He's flying a bucket. That's a different set of rules than the, the rear mount where I can stick the ladder up to the roof and just leave it up there. Okay. So there are, everything is position based and building based and your people have to be trained on those things. I remember when I was a brand new firefighter, Walking into a building, on my way out the door, my captain would say, stop. Was there a front fire escape? Uh, 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 how many mailboxes were there in the lobby? Were the mailboxes on both sides of the lobby? Were the mailboxes on one side of the lobbies? How many apartments were there per floor? How many doors were there per floor? And you've got you to gotta get your people to think about these things. Are they, is there a front entrance and a rear entrance in this apartment? Is there, you know, a normal way in a lot of the old railroad flats, shotgun flats, whatever you want to call them, you enter through the back of the apartment and go through and the front door is only just a secondary means of egress, but they never use it. They use it as wall space. They put the uh, space in there, they put the space in there and it says everything is, stays there. So. That's just part of what's got to go on, okay? So we have to know our buildings and have to know our assignments. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a student of Ladders 4, and uh, I read about it in John Norman years ago. Uh, your typical two-and-a-half-story frame, uh, providing it's a, it's a single family, which it may not necessarily be anymore, anymore with a porch roof. Uh, you get a sense of, if you, if you get people up on the porch roof, am I correct in saying that you'll be able to VES two bedrooms? You can get, if, depending on the size of the porch roof, depending on the size of the porch roof, you can uh, do that, Bill. Um, it, again, it depends on if it's a full porch, a full front porch, or if it's just a porch over the front door. Okay. But what's going to happen in that building is the chauffeur on the ladder truck is going to take the front of the building. And when he takes the front of the building, he's going to make sure that he's got the front of the building with the aerial or the towel ladder. And he's going to go through those windows off the porch roof, the OV and the roof man, because we're not going to the roof in a private dwelling are going to go to the other windows on the exposures side, depending on which looks like it's a, a go spot for us to go in. So they're going to take that whole idea and go in there and follow, okay? And it's all part of knowing your buildings, knowing your district, knowing what your team is doing. You know, we, we, uh, we use our medical calls as an opportunity. Now we pretty much burnt these things down, but uh, uh, we, we have a lot of concrete block construction. That was not always the case in, in Miami. We have a lot of homes uh, where the front of the home uh, side one or alpha is half a living room and then there's a dividing wall and if you follow that wall in the smoke you will come to an opening and there's not usually a door there you make a 180 and you'll come back up the hallway to the master bedroom if you 
Once you search that, then you head down, you'll run into a bathroom and a couple of bedrooms. If you stay on the other side of the wall, you'll end up in the dining room, kitchen, utility room. And that's the old Flagler, Dade County, Pine, wood frame homes. So we, we, that's a way that we would pattern uh, our searches. Uh, the other thing is in Miami, uh, the efficiencies in the rear are a, a huge, huge consideration. In fact, it's such a consideration that our house fire prop that we have at our uh, training center has what we call the abuelas quarters where grandma moved in and they either built an efficiency in the back or divided it, but if the fire is back there, you're not reaching it through the front door. Uh, Sam, as far as building specific searches in the Wichita area, uh, do you do you categorize them similar to uh, the FDNY? I mean, the thing about the Midwest is we get influence from the West Coast, we get our own influences, and we get influence from the East Coast. So. Uh, our building stock is truly diverse. Uh, now, I kind of look at the uh, city kind of like rings of a tree. Um, you really can see where we initially established by the rivers, and that's where we get our universities, our hospitals, um, was the beginning of the city, right? Um, and then as it starts to branch out, you can start to see where we went through the energy crisis and we started to put less windows in. Um, then you can start to see where we put more windows in with the new construction and went to the open floor plan. So um, each firehouse, you know, has a standard kind of building stock that they can get familiar with. And it comes back to everything that's been said in this group already. When you pull up, you can generally look at a house or a footprint of that neighborhood and say, okay, all the bedrooms, um, it's a shotgun bungalow. So all the bedrooms are gonna be on one side. Um, it's a newer construction. So we're gonna have the master on one side and the kids' bedrooms on the garage side. And then the master is gonna be opposite the garage side. So they're not annoyed by people coming in and out of the garage in the kitchen. Sam, um, I wanna pose a question to Clark. This is another thing that we've discussed. Uh, one of the criticisms I've heard, Clark, about VES is it's too slow because you gotta target each bedroom from a window. Uh, but that is not necessarily true, correct? That's not true, Cap. We had uh, several years ago, we had a situation where um, confirmed victim rolled up, there was a fire uh, in the downstairs window, downstairs, uh, I'm not sure if it was a bedroom or what, but uh, fire was auto venting out of that window, up the side of the building, and it was vent and it was going into a window directly above it uh engine company arrives and uh witnesses say there was a woman in that window screaming and then she just collapsed into the window so they could not the company could not veis that window because they're the first ones on scene and the captain chose to go to rescue mode is what we call it so he could not ladder that that particular window because there's fire blowing up from below into it so he chose to ladder the bedroom window next to that window threw the ladder up they did a successful veis went in that window did a real rapid search of that of that room they went into the hallway down the hallway into that room went into that bedroom and located the woman in exactly where the uh, witnesses said she would be she had recent back surgery she was not able to get out herself and as far as the you you folks in uh, miami Dade talking about the the isolating yourselves sheltering in that in that uh, room that would have been a good option uh, for this situation because so they located this woman. It was a downstairs fire, it was a first floor fire. They had fire blowing up the stairwell into the hallway, and then they also had fire blowing out of that window into the window. So these guys were in a pickle. They had fire in the window, and then they had fire in the hallway. They chose to, we got to get this woman out, and they were going to take her down the hallway, pull her down the hallway to the bedroom where her ladder, where the ladder was. <clears throat> and they were going to take her down the ladder like that. Fortunately, the, the engineer on the engine company pulled the two and a half off and he put the two and a half nozzle inside that bedroom window and knocked down the majority of the fire. And the company said, the two guys that were inside that, inside that room said, we noticed an immediate reduction in heat and smoke, immediate reduction. And they thought, they thought someone must have vertically ventilated this, this 
this building, but they didn't hear any sauce. They opened up the bedroom door, um, reduction in heat, and they successfully drug this woman down the hallway into the original room where their ladder was, and then they carried the woman down the ladder. It's a great story, and uh, you got to know what you're doing. And again, door isolation. Um, I've never been in that situation, but I'm going to guess that uh, if we vs one room, and then we're going to move to another room, I would close the bedroom door of the room that we VES because because we've created a flow path. We don't want it going in there. So um, I don't know if that was a factor there, but um, somebody was, uh, I, I would call it a hashtag, I'm so computer illiterate, about the pace of search during training versus the pace uh, in the, when it's the real deal. And yeah, we, we tend to, uh, at least in our experience, uh, we need to speed things up when, in training because of the pay. we typically go too slow and try to be too thorough. Now, some of that comes from recruit training years ago when we used to be looking for a spanner wrench or something like that. Uh, but uh, I, I, the, the, whoever opined, uh, you have a good point there, is that you got to keep things moving. Uh, fellas? We started about five minutes too late, and uh, so or, uh, so we're going to end five minutes too late. And uh, I want to thank our sponsor again, Key. That's keyhose.com. Take the key challenge uh, and try to kink the key hose. Uh, I can't wait for a key if you're watching. Send us some of that combat sniper our way over to Miami Dade. We'll put it together uh, with the recruits on the drill ground, and we will beat the crap out of it. And uh, we'll put it to the torture test. So, uh, Key, if you're listening, send some of that uh, combat sniper hose uh, our way. That is such an aggressive uh, name for it, though. I don't know, combat, combat sniper. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I guess, I, are you comfortable with it? No, no, I like it. I like it. <laughs> I'm getting triggered, Bill. I have to go to a safe space. It, it, it suits me. <laughs> you got to go to your safe space. Yeah, I'm just not feeling safe. It, it, it suits me. Yeah. Yeah. Juan, thank you so much. No, you no, and you. Chief George, what you guys are doing for our department. And in turn, we share it with the nation's fire service. And it makes me very proud to be a part of this group every month with our Captain Mike and also um, to be a small part of what you're doing as well. So, uh, so we're going to continue this discussion uh, next month, I think. It'll be Captain Mike and myself, and then we're going to have some other young, ruggedly handsome individuals on uh to look at the uh, search and the protection of life from maybe a different point of view so until next month thank you key thank you captain mike sam thank you and sam i don't give a damn how tired you are you're still always on the top of your game you know sam you do look tired though you look in fact you look you when you get tired i notice you lose the muscle tone in your face. You look like a friggin' Sharpe. Yeah. Look at that. Doesn't he? Bro. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. All right, Chief George Clark. Me compadre. All right, man. Thank Until you. next month, God bless you guys. Thank you, General. Take care. George. See you.